Welcome to Shop Talks. We're lucky to have John Phenom here, starter of brands, graphic designer, YouTube star, and uh, all around good guy, identical twin. <laughs> He's got it all going on here. <laughs> Hi, Alex, if you watch this, uh, my uh, twin brother is a principal of a middle school, so <laughs> I'll make him watch this now later. All right, I want to thank Impressions and Haynes uh, who sponsored this, and the, I'm from the Ink Kitchen, and we're gonna talk about starting a brand. It's a common thing people want to do. So uh, let's start a little uh, off a little. Do you talk people out of starting a brand ever and why? <laughs> that is such a great question. Um, let me, let me, I'll back up a little bit, like 30,000 feet to give, give some context. Um, so uh, coming into like being, well now online, I'm known as like clothing brand mentor is like, a little subline, but prior to this, um, I was just telling Pam, was uh, like I would be working, right? So my whole career, I've, I've worked in apparel over 20 years. So I started as an apparel designer at a small skate company in San Diego, and then went on to be a senior men's designer and then creative director. So I, I held director at the, at the last several companies in-house, but I would be the guy that people would ask, um, hey, I'm so-and-so's friend, and um, I wanted to start a clothing line and uh, they said I should come and talk to you. And so a lot of people I felt were, were guarded. I mean, I don't know, maybe people are still guarded. I was never like that, you know, uh, um, a, my apparel and my love for, for forging brands and working for brands is, is, is a part of my life, it's not my whole life. So I, I'm really open and I would just start sharing with people. You're the perfect in kitchen shop talk <laughs> <laughs> speaker because we're all about sharing. So, right. So, and, and you kind of have a unique perspective because you really are a business person, like a lot of business interests besides brands. And yet you also are a graphic designer. Yeah. And you all, also, for a while, ran a print shop. Yes. So I think yeah. that there aren't that many people that are conversant in all those areas. You can bridge a lot of gaps, whereas uh, a lot of people either come from just art or just business or just printing. And I think that's a unique perspective, actually. So I bet people are pretty happy to find you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it ends up uh, to be like really good conversations, depending on who I'm talking to. And in that aspect, the funny thing is uh, it, uh, before, I mean, uh, you know, my, my social media career, how it's changed my my design and directing career is, has changed it completely. But when I would get on with a brand, the first person I would actually have lunch with is a sales director or director of sales. So that is weird for the art department to have the creative director have, you know, be really aligned with sales. Because a lot of times it's like bloods and cribs, like, like the sales guys and then the art guys, it's like, oh, they don't understand us. And the sales guys are just make everything in navy and black and white, right? Um, but l let me come back to, to your first question, oh, actually. Yeah. So people would come to me and say, hey, I want to start a clothing line, and I'm so-and-so's friend. And uh, so in terms of talking people out of a brand, I did do that a lot in the beginning. Because it, like, it was like coming into a war with a pocket knife. <laughs> But they just have this belief, like I have this one design that's gonna blow it up. It's gonna, it's gonna make me millions, you know. I, I think actually, as a printer, I've had a lot of people come in and they'll see a Nike shirt and they will say, "I can, I can do better than that," and they don't realize the whole enormity of the enterprise. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you can make a better hamburger than McDonald's, you, you could be successful, right? Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> that's the or one of the analogies is like. I mean, it, so there's, there's a lot of brands like streetwear brands, for example, that's specifically the niche that I, I'll come from. And like the life of that brand could be typically somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of five years when they're really pumping and making money. But they're gonna come and they're gonna go, but people might see that brand and say, oh, I could do a lot better than them, right? Or like you're saying Nike, which is like the biggest case study in the world, but, but that, like people can say, oh, I can make a better hamburger or cheeseburger than McDonald's. It's like, yeah, everyone can, but that, that's not what you're competing with. You're competing with their system and their process. So I think from talking to you, you realized that people are gonna do it anyway though, right? <laughs> yeah, so that, what I realized is if someone, most of my work now is consulting. So I've, I've consulted with brands all over the US and then a little bit in the UK. 
uh, because or brands that want to sell in the uh, American market. Right. But if they have five thousand dollar budget, they're gonna go till they spend the whole five thousand dollar budget. Whether you and I are like, hey man, you want to slow down, maybe uh, just test really little first. And I, what the term I use on my channel is proof of concept. Uh, you want to get proof of concept before then you you put another chunk of money into it. So, actually, let's get into that a little. So, at, at various amounts of money, how do you advise people? You know, so what, what's sort of the the low end, and and how do you you probably advise differently depending on the budget, right? Right. So, uh, it, it 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 relates to a question where where the great Google question is how much money does it take to launch a brand, and the answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is it depends, yep. right? Because if you look at case studies of brands that have success, and also there's going to be varying uh, like definitions of success. Like if you want a brand to just pop for like three to five years and make like millions, like low millions, it's like that's that's totally possible. But for me, like even in my 20s when I was when I was working with these brands and seeing that pattern, I was like, all right, I'm going to launch a brand one day, try to make a couple million, and put all the money in real estate. And then see what happens, right? Because it's very, um, it's very rare. Uh, so in streetwear, I'll, I'll use uh, Stussy as a case study. Stussy's been doing it for years and years and years. And so people will always say, "Oh, he started it out. Of, he's a surfer that started it out of his garage," you right. know. But he sold the brand. And then uh, there's different minds involved that are saying, "How can we elongate the brand?" Right? So. Um, retail now is in such a, this is a whole other conversation. Uh, selling to retail is such a big landscape that I knew one of the uh, sales managers at one point at Stussy, and she spent a lot of her time saying no to certain retail. Sounds crazy. But it was like the strategy was uh, we don't want to overexpose ourselves. Also, if there's too much retail in one area, like it's oversaturated, you, you have to stay loyal to certain Make retail. Make everyone mad. <laughs> exactly. No yeah. one happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, in it depends. Usually, I'll go case by case basis. So, uh, I'll even I'll even consult brands that won't give me a number amount, but they're they're just trying. To, I'm like, hey, let's just go proof of concept. Um, cause, so I I go all the way to people who like I don't even have money to trademark to like right. yeah to like oh maybe but, I have you know like, as you say it actually we recently printed for somebody and. Um, you say what defines success. For them, they just wanted to have a brand, which is an ancillary to the rest of their business, and it really gave them credibility with their graphic design customers. So for them, success was just that it launches and it exists, and right. they really didn't like, weren't trying to make a living from that aspect of their business. So that's a very different definition than someone that wants to make millions. Right, and I would say it, it alleviates some pressure too. I have a friend, uh, Chris, and he, he works for a company that's actually um, a subsidiary of, uh, of, of Disney. So he has his designer job all day, but he has a brand that he, uh, Glamorous uh, Loving Kids, and he's been glamour, Glamorous Living Kids, and he's been running it just alongside his, his you know what I mean? Right. Like it's, it's a passion project. Passion yeah. project, I yeah. like that. I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm keeping that one. Less pressure, <laughs> you could be more creative, you know? But. I got the better hamburger. I got the passion project. <laughs> I think I got this. Oh, I, um, I, got a, I got a ton of them. <laughs> so, um, so what are the key areas that when someone does want to start that you go over with them? You know. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll begin with the end in mind, but uh, but I, it depends on what their end is, right? So, like, it, it depends. Like, if 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 we're just talking about product, so I'll I'll get called for for anything. Like, uh, even so, beyond people who know me, like from the internet. It's like before that I was doing contracted work. So I could do I could do a season if you want to do if you want me to do a spring or fall line or like SMU work. Uh, yeah, I guess it's different whether someone comes to you with the designs or they come to you with right. the business concept. I guess right. That's so different, I, right? it's weird. I like so nowadays um, I'll I'll turn away design work just because the consulting work uh, and now like the social media stuff is more interesting to me. Also I'm re <laughs> this is funny. I'm really open with them. Someone just emailed me about some design work, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I forgot what it was, but I, I said, I'm not going to touch anything for under uh, 250 a garment or a design. And I said, I'll, I'll be honest, you can go on to Fiverr and find someone who will do it for cheaper, because I just, I don't have the time, but 
I mean, you could find some quality people there. I could also give you a reference of other designers, right. uh, but it depends. Yeah. So what do you, when people come to you, is there a common thing that they usually don't understand, like that you have oh, to, uh, you know, break down for them? What's the most common thing that you uh, have to go over that they probably didn't think of until all right. they, they, they met you? That's a great question. There's a couple things. Um, so what you're describing is what I'm doing while they're, they're talking to me. And I have a whole a form that kind of familiarizes me with them. So when we start to talk, it's like rock and roll, right? But um, let's talk, a, let, we'll take a specific example. Sure, so sure. Someone, someone has some designs. Maybe they have you know, five or 10 and a concept, and they don't really know what to do after that. What, what are the first things that you talk to them about that? Oh, gosh. So, so if, first of all, if, if, if you're going to be an actual brand, right? So that, that could happen for merch, right? For merch, for, if you're an artist, it's pretty simple, because they're going to keep pumping out the music. So you can rap. They're already, the art direction's already done. They're going to do an album. The album's going to have, uh, you know, 16 songs or more, whatever makes it to the album. So that's gonna be wrapped around all of these concepts already. So for me, I'm like, hey, just coincide with that. So now whoever's working it, or if I'm art directing it, I'm saying, okay, this is the name of the album. This is how we're gonna drop the merch. Um, great case study, everything that uh, Eminem did for any of the last several albums, his merch drops have been amazing. I, I know some of the designers who worked on that and they come from fashion. So, so that's moving forward a lot, but. He probably learned because actually I know a person that did his early stuff. Oh, nice. And it didn't go, work out very well. <laughs> so, right. So they must have learned from their mistakes, but they probably had the money to do that. Sure, and like, so the, the crazy thing about that actually is now that there's like, like individual, so many influencers, like micro, like I'm a super small micro influencer, um, those people are now doing merch. So for someone in music to get more of a fashion touch to it is like more of an advanced level. But to answer your question, if someone has a, wants to do a brand, like this is a brand that I wanna do over time, over several seasons, um, you, you have to have you know, idea, you should have concepts and concepts of concepts of brands, or at least- I mean, the first thing you probably have to go over is the season. You want to say what the whole idea of the season? Sure. I bet people don't even know that. Well, okay, so, yes, especially now- got five great designs, like a yeah. company, right? Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, spring, spring and fall, your big, you know, your big deliveries, right? And then uh, back to school, and, and holiday are big ones. And we say back to school for that season because whether it's high school or college, but in my demographic, which is men's streetwear, um, that's gonna always be prevalent, right? A skate, skate culture, any of that, a back to school is really prevalent. But I'm glad you brought that up. Now, in, in, while we're recording this, things have changed so much, right? Like the seasonal buy is based on retail needing it oh, right. at a certain time, right? right? So we used to, uh, I know some people watching this are gonna remember, the trade show though in Vegas, right? All the brands would show up and all the buyers would show up, right? So they do the shopping for the entire world there. Right. Whether you're from uh, Tokyo, the UK, whatever, uh, New York to Los Angeles, right? right? And so now, if, if you've been to the show lately, it's decimated because the internet exists. So the basis of creating a brand has changed now. So I'll mention seasons for sure if that brand is going to do retail or wholesale business. Right, brick right? and mortar. Brick and mortar, right? Which is still prevalent, it's still prevalent. I know, people it's, forget that brick and mortar is still the biggest, very it's much not so. online, right? Right, right. Online's growing, but brick and mortar is the biggest, right? Right, someone, actually someone on my channel was like, oh, you, you, you hate brick and mortar or whatever, and I was like, no, 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 things are getting obviously very interrupted right now for various reasons that we all know about. But there's, there's, people are still doing millions with it. Now, if I talk to a brand, there's definitely a route where a brand just goes online. So what I say is uh, your drop or your collection or your capsule can then be open to whatever calendar you have. Right, but you can't just have those designs. So what's the turnover on an internet only brand at this point? Like how often do they have to have new material? Oh, gosh. Well, he, so... Because I think that's a revelation to a lot of people that they can't just coast on these better hamburgers, you know? <laughs> um, love that analogy. Um, so, uh, the tone of work can be quick in terms of offering, right? I just did a video on this, but there's... For the seasonal collection or capsule, right, that's more traditional. So, so, this is one thing. Like, when I'm consulting with a brand, I'll say, are you planning to sell retail? Because that's going to 
uh, change the way you do your, your, your pricing structure, right? right? Because then you want to you wanna incorporate that into inviting retail into, into the money that you're making, right? Into your, your profit and loss. But if you're, if you're purely like an online company, you're selling direct to customer now, right? So now it's B2C, you could do, you could do 12 drops, but they don't have to be full collections. Right. right. That's different, for sure. Uh, of course, where in seasonally, like you gotta have, you have to have jackets, right, for holiday. You have to, and, and Q4 for retail is huge, no matter what. But in terms of a functional, a functional design, you need thermals, you need hoodies, you need layering, right? But with a person who's like, oh, I'm not gonna sell to retail, it, let's say it's an influencer, okay? Like, whatever they have going on, like, oh, I have this big event happening in November. So that would it's be a, when they would drop this stuff. There right? you go. You're gonna promote that. If it's sponsored, a company's gonna come in on that. Hey that would be a good time to drop merch for that. So now, it's the same analogy as a music artist, right? They have an album coming out, they have an EP, or maybe they're doing a tour. So that tour merch or whatever, you're gonna say, okay, on our social medias, we're gonna do a drop on that. So it changes, right, from, right. from seasonal. So what aspects of, of budget do you have to go over with someone that wants to start a brand? I mean, they, they pro I, mean I know I meet a lot of people because I print, and that's all they think about. So what are the other things that people have to think about budgeting if they're starting a brand? Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll just get right down to basics. I mean, first thing I'll tell them is most of your money, this is the same for screen printing, or uh, most of your budget's gonna be spent on production, unless, you know, there's obviously, especially um, in an area like this, you know that uh, like Printify, Printful, and like uh, print on demand, it has been, uh, a game changer in a lot of different ways, but so where there's no risk to the brand, right. but what they don't understand is is there's like pretty much no margin, right? So if you want a detailed design where you're gonna do a neck print, you have a PL, you have a front hit, maybe you're like design wise, you're like, oh, I don't want a side hit, that's gonna cost you. I mean, for them to do the 3PL, right? If they're shipping straight to the customer, <laughs> good luck, right? <laughs> you're gonna make you're gonna make a dollar on that. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, I, I get sometimes is, um, you think it's a good idea to just buy printing equipment and print your own? <laughs> a lot of people think that, you, and I meet you, a lot of people at the show, right. so, so what do you think of that do, idea? Do you, ha do you have conversations where you talk people out of it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dude. I'm a nice guy, you know. <laughs> sometimes, anyway. <laughs> Some of the vendors are like, no, they should buy it. Just kidding. Um, no, we're, we're real, real here. You can tell the truth. No, I'm going to be real. When in doubt, I've tell tried the truth. to talk so many people out of buying equipment. I really have. Um, I mean, I, what I, I, do meet, I, I do meet people, I'm sure you do, that they really want to get their hands on it, and that's what they want to do. Sure. So if I think they're, they're craftspeople, and like, that's, like, they, they're like, this is what I'm going to do. There's a spot in my garage. I'm gonna hook up the electrical and have a little dryer. That's all a of good that. point. Cause, so if they're a craftsperson, that makes sense. That might. If they yeah. want to save money. Yeah. So on their printing. So again, <laughs> I'll begin with the end in mind. I'll say, what is your goal? If you tell me, oh, I want to do a multi-million dollar. I'm trying to buy. I'm trying to buy a Lambo off my 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 brand. And then, I'm, okay. So best and highest use, right, of every person. Bro, you're gonna end up. You're gonna end up outsourcing that at some point because you don't want to handle all those units. Um, but I mean, you know, I think this is like the earlier conversation. If they're dead set on doing it and they did 50 hours of research, I'm like, do it. But I have so many case studies where I'll, like people who consulted with me and I'm like, hey, this is what's going to happen. You're going to start printing. And you're gonna, if you wrangle in like the high school, so you're doing all the PE shorts and everything and you're like, oh, I'm getting clients in. You think you're gonna have time to think of like your brand, to do your brand, after printing all of that stuff in your garage, you're gonna do your own brand? Yeah, even people I've known actually that um, do figure out the printing, you know, hand printing. I mean, if they're even a tiny bit successful, they're ready to like keel over and die. They can't produce enough usually. For, you know, if you're going from zero to 60, you're, you're gonna have to give it up at some point and get someone with automatic equipment, et cetera. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just tell them it's, it's not the Visa commercial that you're, th that you're thinking. You know, it's, a, it's hard, it's manual work. 
So, and then the other thing is, there's so many good, there's bad printers and there's a lot of good printers, right? It's like, I always say it's like a mechanic shop, right? But you can find someone who literally has 10, 20 years of experience and that's what they do. And they can have fair pricing. But also, if you're thinking of scaling your brand, if you think about scalability, just from a basic business perspective, how are you gonna run the business, create new concept for design or, or business development? Any of that stuff when you're like, oh, I gotta print 100 shirts though, and then I'm gonna be, then I'm gonna be my CEO cap. Right, so if you make really good designs, they'll sell themselves, right? Oh, I love this. <laughs> we, we should do a podcast. Um, we do. Well, yeah, so, that's next. There we go. <laughs> Just hooking you in yeah. here. <laughs> I will be in a future episode talking about this in depth, but um, no, you, you, no, just good design. First of all, first of all, I, I love that I can talk to artists because I come from art, right? right? So there, there, there's a part of me that just gets in, brought in for business which is, which is awesome, but then I can also put, produce like a fall and spring line and talk to the designers and say, hey, um, you know, let's look at all of our research for this, for this next drop that we're, we're gonna do. Let's think about it, you know, and all of that, but. It's almost like having a, a, another language. You have the business is, language, the yeah. graphic language. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so let's go with the analogy. Let's say you make that burger that's better than McDonald's. The whole key to that analogy is uh, McDonald's has a process for selling it. So you might make the best design. This is, this is super hot design right now. It could hang with whoever's doing millions right now, but how do you get it in, in front of the customer? Or how do you get the retail to want to work with you to say, yeah, uh, we want to carry you in our shop. There's, there's so much there. So what are the basics of that even? You know, like someone that's got a modest you know, brand that they want to get going. Uh, right. So, uh, usually they are hyper-focused into maybe design, right? So if it's a designer, wh what I'm trying to do is, is if they're, so typically they don't want to partner with anyone because they want to do it their way, which, oh, which, is, which, is, which is good. So to be honest, I'm trying to gauge how much uh, logistical prowess they have for business. So if we look on a scale, the most brilliant artist is, has probably zero logistical bone, right? So what I'll be trying to do is open their, their mind up to say, um, hey, we gotta think about boring stuff like, uh, like balancing the budget and like looking at the, like, so you have a projected profit, Let, let's look at losses and like what all of this is gonna, like the cost of doing business. And then another thing, so, Things that are boring, like picking and shipping, like who's gonna do that? It's like, oh, my little brother's gonna do that, or my, my mom's gonna help me, and it's like, okay. Uh, it's good if you want your mom and your little brother to hate you eventually, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, when they're like, oh, I'm not gonna do that. It's like, oh, I, I don't have a plan B. But I try to get them to look holistically at what they're trying to do, rather than, they're typically hyper-focused on, you know, the exciting things like design and. I mean, I actually get people that never really realized, like, they got to produce so many shirts to get the price down. And then right. what does that look like physically? Like, where do you keep that? Like, they, they have no knowledge of, like, how much room that takes. Right. So, like, uh, you know what, what shocks people is uh, we'll talk about costing, like, for apparel garments, right? So when you go to the, sh to, the, to the shops, you know, like, right over here and you see everything, I'll tell people, because they'll say, how much does stuff cost? It's like, my, my general rule, rule of thumb is if you just divide it by four, it's, it's the cost of the garment landed, right? R roughly, roughly, it depends. That, that's with mass production. So they'll be thinking in that way, you know, but it's like, yeah, you could get a, sh a shirt done for seven bucks, let's say a t-shirt printed for seven bucks, but you, you, you have to have, there's minimums involved. You have to house the minimums. And then, you know, the part that none of them want to talk about is, is, is making sure you have good, a really good customer service to get it to them, because everyone's competing with Amazon for the timelines? Even people that do the math sometimes, I find they uh, will have, you know, all right, I'm gonna print 300, that gets it to a reasonable price, and we're gonna do five designs. They don't, what they don't realize is when they're halfway through that inventory, the sizes aren't gonna be right. Even if you got a crystal ball, you're not right. gonna be perfect. So suddenly, if you thought you're planning on having 1,500 shirts in inventory, you're pretty quickly gonna have 2,500 shirts in inventory. Right. Because you're gonna have to reprint, right? Right, I mean, like, it's a whole nother aspect. Like, so, to, then when I get into, like, 
um, taking apart what a what a proper clothing company does. It's like, oh, what is a what is a production manager or production director do? Like just that whole part right there. It's like, oh, part of what they do is they manage size scales. What the hell is that? And it's like, have you ever heard of a two four two four four two? It's like. That's a size scale. So if your average customer is like everyone in America is gonna be like large, is like your big thing, that's gonna be like let's say you start you start at small, it might be one, two, four. So you're gonna have a different formula for your size scales, but just as an example, that's one person who really kind of looks at that and tries to look at their customer, how it's growing, and then obviously you're looking at stats. So how did we do with this last drop, this last season? Because What's gonna happen is if, if I'm ordering from your shop, of course, once we get to the, the price and you give me my terms, it's gonna be like, all right, let's hit the total button and you're gonna say, how many do you want us to make though, right? So a production manager is gonna say, okay, for our soft goods per graphic, we're gonna do this for all of this artwork, for the hoodies, we'll do this. For cut and sew, for our, for our, our jackets, we're gonna do this, this and that, but that's just one person, so when, um, when we're talking about the anatomy of a clothing company, and it's like, oh, what do people do? Sometimes people oversimplify, like, oh, I could do that, I could do all of that. And like, you could, you're not gonna do it at a multi-million dollar brand level. Right. So, um, probably the best thing to make a brand is to uh, do your own uh, cut and sew, uh, <laughs> right? Like, if you wanna, you know, I just want a shirt like this, but I want it a little bit bigger, and I, I wish it was a little heavier. So I can do that, right? That's, that's not that hard, right? At this point, we're just, we're just having a conversation at this point. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, not crazy. Obviously, I get a lot of fashion school students. I was a, like, I was, I've been a portfolio judge uh, in fashion school, but I do like, I do like talking about the, at the, in the colleges. You know why? Because I'll be super real with them yeah. in terms of what they want to do. So, fashion, and, and that's why I think and about. I, and actually, in Los Angeles, it's probably a little more possible to uh, have your own uh, sewn garments that you, to your specs than it would be for someone in another part of the country, probably. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, but so to answer your question, though, to really, really tackle the question, can you make your own samples? And I, I'm saying samples because if, if you're talking about running full production, you can do that too. And obviously I'm speaking in generality. So like there's a person who does it and with social media, they can, they can have a huge following, do really well and do more of the traditional way of like, yeah, I'm gonna do a runway show. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna hand make 20 of these and sell it. There's totally a path there. But for the general average person, I wouldn't even touch. I wouldn't even touch doing the samples, because um, just like we might print uh, the shirts right here for production. Like if you're going overseas, that factory is going to do the mass production. So they do the sampling, right? They do this. They do all of the the size specs. Um, so they're going to send me back a large. They're going to send me back an extra large. I'm going to put it on my people for their size fits to see how it works, see, make sure the shoulder's right and all of the measurements. But in the end of the day, that sample that their factory makes, the, the, a factory will have its own department for sample making. And so those people send back a rough draft of what they're gonna do. But someone with a low budget is not going in that direction, I would guess, right? It's not possible, right? <laughs> um, or it's not, for not a, it would not be easy to take, it the, would not, to yeah. make your own blanks. It's not right. easy on someone starting out, right? Right. That, that would be someone well-funded, right? Sure. I mean, yes. Uh, and the, the reason Cause I, because I, I do run into people that, you know, have a very meager budget and think they're going to design the garments as right. well as their custom prints. That's not possible, is it? I mean, generally speaking, it's. It's, it's not a good idea. And that, so I'll, the reason I hesitate is so because- So what do you do, just tell people what they're in for? And I, well, I'll say, I'll say do star t-shirts and hats, things that are uh, decoratable, you know, because it's a lot more forgiving. And then you could start understanding the flow of creating product, product and, then and then marketing product and shipping product. That's what I say. But I do have the conversation of the person who's like, no, but I wanna make you know, you're a fashion guy, you understand me, I wanna make this jacket and that jacket. And it goes back to what you said, you gotta be funded. Now could one person make it? A person could make it, you know what I mean? But I'm just saying the odds 
are very much against you. Right. You yeah. must be giving people a lot of odds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just like you, I, I keep it really real. I mean, like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to, whenever I'm talking with people, I don't want to mislead them, but a lot of it is, is giving them the, the truths that we're talking about now. Right. Um, I guess relabeling is more of an option than probably like 10 years ago even, right? There's a lot of, there's such a wide array of garments and a lot of them are easily relabeled. Did people go in that direction much? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would say the, the biggest thing is just, just trying to look at prices, right? Like um, anyone, anyone that offers uh, relabeling, another, another thing for that type of product is trying to figure out how deep their inventory is. So, but it's a good solution. A lot of brands do it, yeah. I guess you'd be screwed if you tied into somebody that then doesn't have the same product, right? Yeah, definitely. Or like imagine, so for example, if you go to downtown LA, there's, there's a lot of people that have garments you could relabel. But let's say you go in there, oh, this is, this is, I found like a varsity style jacket. This is, this is dope, I can make some. So you might make something too and say, like, oh yeah, let's go. You might go back to that shop and you're like, oh, we have five left. They're all uh, triple extra large. <laughs> Spent all that time. <laughs> So again, you need money, right? You, so if you say, hey, all we're gonna do is relabel, these are pretty much like blanks. Also, you know, like, I visited factories, China mostly, but uh, China, Korea, Colombia, like all over. And so the makeup of them are, are the same, but once you start to know the people there, they'll say, hey, this order got botched. Can you, can, do you know anyone that would buy these jackets? And there'd be get some good stuff there. Right. But that's relational at that point. It's a relationship. Because right. they're not in the business of trying to sell to the, to the, the person designing the brand. All right, let's uh, open it up for questions. Any questions about starting a brand? So the question is for a print shop that uh, has a brand that approaches them, how can they be good partners? What do they got to look out for? Um, so, so uh, also just for reference sake, I did own, I did own a screen printing shop for three years uh, as well. Um, but when I was so, while my channel was so going, you're smarter than me. You did. No, I no, still do. I wouldn't say I'm, <laughs> I'm smarter than you. you are, dude, you are a living legend in this industry. Um, but so when I dealt with people, sometimes people would email and say, I want to show you some love, and I want to do my my t-shirts with your shop. And our minimum was 144 pieces. We were doing high volume. So I was like, bro, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do 30 shirts. And I'm like, thank you for watching my channel, but we're a high volume shop. Cause I would- Thanks for the love, but how about a big sales I order, right? I would stop mentioning my shop and my YouTubes, I would. Wow. Yeah, we were dealing with Blizzard. You guys know that Blizzard just had the Microsoft buyout, but that, they were one of our clients. But um, to answer your question, so for a brand though, I wouldn't treat them different than like a high school or anyone else. We gave them good service, um, but to get, so I think one of the, one of, maybe one of the questions within this is, you wanna try to get a brand that really produces and, and does well, but in the initial stages, I would just treat them like any, any other customer. But um, definitely, if, if they start, if you start seeing really good results, they, they're getting a lot of reorders. Um, yeah, I mean, as long as your, your terms are there, like, I'm sure, like, hey, we won't charge you again for the screen fee or whatever it is for reprints. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I'll have a lot of them go like, you know, this is going to be huge for whatever reason. Can you give me a deal? It's like, hey, it's going to be huge. You're going to make a lot of money. So, like, why, do you, why are you arguing about the money? You're going to make so much, right? And so you kind of turn I turn it on them. That's what I do. Yeah. Other, other questions? Brand questions. What's the best way to figure out your target demographic? What's the best way to figure out your target demographic? For your great, brand? great question. So, um, so typically, typically when a brand is is coming to me, they they know their their demographic. Or another thing is they might be highly inspired by another brand. So what I do is I, I'll say you you always have to have like at least three case studies, right? So let's say you want to do an athleisure brand, which is at the moment super hot because you could you could tie it into CrossFit, you could tie it into MMA and a lot of things. And then the, the line between athleisure, you know, like everyone's wearing leggings when they're when they're grocery shopping. So product wise, there's a, like a lot of diversity that you could do there. <laughs> but what I would do is uh, grab three three companies that are currently doing very well in that. And not only for your demographic of who you're selling to, right? Look at their same demo, it's like, okay, uh, I'm just throwing this out there, uh, males uh, 16 to 27 or whatever that is. But I would, I would uh, 
take apart their numbers and have three, three case studies. Another thing is, I'll make, if a, brand, if a brand or would-be brand owner is consulting with me, I'll make them do that homework in advance so that immediately, if I, before I have any conversation with them, I have a reference point. I'll even tell them to tell me a brand that they hate. And I'll say, tell me why you hate that brand. So it does a couple things. Verbally, it tells me a lot of information of where their head's at. Visually, as an artist, because they might ask me to do design, it already puts a couple things in context for me. Oh, why do you like Live Fit? You know, like, oh, I, I, whatever, whatever, whatever the, that art direction is for them. But um, in, so for art direction and demographic, that's what I would do. Other questions? All right, I want to uh, thank John Phenom. Check out his YouTube channel. And um, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys. See you guys on the next video. All right, and I want to thank Haynes and Impressions and the Ink Kitchen. All right.